While I'm waiting for everybody to get here from the class, I thought I'd make a brief intro for those of you who could not make it today to the uh, physical class. There's three groups that we're interested in. The unicons, the opisthocons, and the animalia. Okay. The unicons have only one flagellum. That's an, odd, an oddball thing within the animal kingdom, but we have only one flagellum. That includes two major groups, the, uh, you, the amoebozoa and the opisthocanta. The amoebozoa are the bulk of the amoeba, but not all. It's, apparently, it's very easy to make blobs. The opisthocanta keep that plesiomorphism, the single flagellum, okay? And which you, that are that synaptomorphy, I should say, that unites the them with the amoebozoa. However, their flagellum is located at the hiney of the cell, and it trails rather than propels or runs or runs alongside the cell. So anybody in the opisthocons have a trailing flagellum one trailing flagellum, amoebozoa one flagellum. And if it's trailing, you get into the opisthocons. There are a number of groups in the opisthocons, uh, including the fungi, okay, and the philos amoeba, which are the ones that make these long, long projections, okay, uh, very finger-like projections. And also the coanozoa. So remember, the philos amoeba, long finger-like projections, they're very, very, uh, quite beautiful, actually. Um, and then things like this, the coanozoa. And the coanozoa, let me move over a little bit, are characterized by this cone of feeding um, uh, projections. So I am, should be recording. You should see the little recording icons up towards the top. And basically, if you've got uh, your picture up right now, this is consent to be recorded. Consent, okay. So uh, discussion boards we talked about. So the discussion, if you have any questions about systematics or you put it in here, uh, if you've got a question about the class, general class, that goes into unit zero, okay. Uh, the at course home, I included the systematics glossary just now, which has got some uh, basically summarizes all the terms you'll ever want to know, ever I swear on um, systematics, and uh, it's pretty easy to use. There's a couple of helpful videos on sponges, one of which I'm going to show this week, the Shape of Life one, and. Um, and again, if, in case you were wondering if there's any practical applications for phylogenetics, they're doing phylogenetic analyses, cladistic analyses of the um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus in Boston, and they've discovered there have been at least 80 separate introductions of that virus within Boston using exactly these kinds of techniques we've talked about um, in class. So it, it's, it's a pretty, a uh, good thing. And then there's also a pretty good video on the Quenozoa here. Now, if you're looking for a camera viewer for your uh, home camera, there's one called uh, um, SI, right here. That's letter S, then E-Y-E. -E. Uh, you can get it at this location for a download. That's what I did. And um, I just want to show you my camera, I'm gonna, uh, uh, just turning it on, PC camera. I'm trying to get it on the PC camera now. Uh oh, I may have a, another problem. It's not moving. Oh, not a touch screen, that's why. Okay, I am now sharing, I'm gonna bring up SI. There is my device, 
and I'm going to share my share an animal with you. If I can find it now, there it is. Isn't he handsome? That is a male mosquito. Now, how do I know it's a boy? Okay, uh, might as well start our first group of insects right now. Okay. This is a mosquito. This is what mosquitoes look like. As you notice, they only have one set of wings. That puts them in the order Diptera, Diptera, like pterodactyl, P-T-E-R, -E pterodactyl, those big uh, dinosaur-like critters with the wings. Terra means wing dactyl finger, so the winged fingers are the names for those giant uh, guys. Diptera is two-winged. They, that's the group that includes the flies. Let me see if I can get a nice, a better image here. Turn him right side up. There he goes. Okay. The mosquitoes in particular are noted for hairy wings. Okay. So if we see if we can get uh, the wing in focus here a little bit. They're long bodied and I can get the wing in focus. You can see all the little hairs around, along the wing, along the veins of the wing. And that is something, if you don't have those hairs on the vein, you do not have a mosquito. That is one of their key characteristics. The crane flies, they look like giant mosquitoes. You'll see them around in the summer. You figure if you get bit by one of those things, you're dead. Um, crane flies, they're the sister group. They're the sister clade to the mosquitoes. Like the mosquitoes, they are peaceful pollinators, okay? Except that the mosquito, female mosquitoes become carnivores, you know, actually hemativores, going after blood, hemivores, um, when they have to lay their eggs. So they're both diptera, okay? And here we go. You know, you can tell a male dip, uh, mosquito because they have to sniff out females. Literally, they find the female not through vision, but through smell, the pheromones. So these guys have these absolutely beautiful bushy antennas, okay, on their, bot, on their uh, which the females don't have. The antennas of the female mosquito look a lot more like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree, you know, just a few branches here and there. So, so. This is a good time also to talk a little bit more about biomimicry. The um, mosquitoes have some superpowers that are really pretty cool, besides being able to find you no matter where you are. Um, a lot of biting insects can do that. These guys have, their superpower is that they can fly in a rainstorm. So you think just because it's raining out, the mosquitoes will be gone and you're safe. You're not going to get bitten. Nonsense. Okay. They still bite. Um, they can, so the question becomes, how do they do it? There's this little tiny mosquito and this rain is pelting on them. I mean, it's just coming down and that raindrop weighs about as much as they do. So how do they survive and still fly? It turns out that those little hairs on the body and on the wings help break the surface tension of that bubble of water. They have a hydrophobic body for the most part and the, they literally go into the drop and it moves down around them and falls. That is a superpower. And uh, so they literally fly, the raindrop doesn't pound on them, it just literally slides over them and continues along its way. That to me is just so cool. The other thing they have is, as you probably have noticed, is this incredible proboscis that in the female can slide into skin. And you don't even know they're there, okay? That, that can stand on you. And most of the time you have no clue that the mosquito's there until it uh, takes its uh, proboscis out and flies away. 
where might we possibly, okay, hold on, I've got to open up the chat here. Okay, there, I got the chat open, thank you. Where might we possibly use, okay, something like that? If you got any ideas, just kind of put it in the chat. So we got the proboscis, it's literally going into you. No, you don't even feel it until it comes out. Who'd want to be able to replicate something like that? Needles, medicine, you got it. The uh, hypodermic, there actually is a hypodermic syringe to, that is based upon the mosquito, uh, proboscis. Not, not only what it is, is they have to micro etch the tip. So if this is the tip of the, of the uh, proboscis, you put a micro etching into it to make it like a serrated knife. Serrated knives work because they put more pressure on fewer spots. So when you're pressing the knife into the bread to cut it, the entire blade of the knife is not taking that uh, pressure. It's just like every other spot uh, on the serration. And so it goes through, uh, you're, you're concentrating the pressure to get through. Between the slightly analgesic saliva that they use and the, um, the serrated tip, okay, you don't feel the thing going in. They don't, you don't feel it as they're cutting and literally moving the cells to the side as they go in. So this is something we have studied, we've learned, we can do. And of course, it just costs too much for day-to-day -day use. So it hasn't gotten a, a, a very wide spread. But think about microsurgery tools, micro manipulation tools for laboratories. All these things could, uh, we can learn from the mosquito. I still wanna know how to do that trick of, with, with the flying inside the raindrop. So um, let's show you another insect. So you'll have two orders under your belt today, okay? That's Diptera. Let's see if I can get this one in here. Oops, let me turn him up right side up. Any ideas? Flea. Flea. Yep, that is a flea. Siphonoptera. Uh, this is actually a cat flea. Now, how do I know this is a cat flea? Well, the cat flea here has two combs. See the comb here? That's called a pronotal comb because the, the uh, segment that it's on is called the pronotum. It's just the technical term with the insects. So that's the pronotum. And then right here, it's coming off the cheeks of the insect, uh, the genial. So that's called the genial comb. And if you've got those two, you've, uh, you have either a dog or a cat flea. And if you got it in North America, you've got a cat flea because we don't have dog fleas, okay? Uh, dog fleas are incredibly rare over here. Um, so if your dog gets fleas, he actually probably has cat fleas. The human flea looks a little bit like this. And when you start trying to tell one species of flea or fly from another, you often get into something they call the ketology. Keta, which is a term that's gonna come up over and over again, are the little hairs, these little tiny bristles that you find on animals. <clears throat> and in insects, they are all these major bristles, like this one or these, the one that's right under the eye here, okay? So the ones on the leg. So keta are these bristles, they're the hairy looking things. And it's the ketology that lets you tell one uh, flea from another or often one fly from another, one species of fly or mosquito from another. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing on that one, but it, this gives, gives you an idea of, of how nice these little scopes are. This is such an imp improvement over um, what we used to have just uh, 10 years ago. It's, it's, it's uh, amazing. Yes, I want to exit the application. 
Okay, now the, I've got another one here. You don't have to worry about modic images. That has to do with the, uh, the, the Zeiss scope. Okay, that uh, we're, we're gonna use for some of the high power stuff here. Any questions, just uh, put them into the, into the, uh, whatchamacallit, um, chats. Okay, so uh, let's see. I'm just trying to manipulate things. I got too many, too much stuff open here. Okay. Um, if there's no questions on cladistics, okay, I'd kind of like to get started then on this week's material on the Quanazoa. So, uh, if you is. Everybody ready for that? Just kind of do the hand thumbs up response if so. Yep. Yep. Three, four, eight. We got pretty much a full, almost a full house there. Yeah, we got a full house. Okay, so let's start looking at the Koanozoa. Um, so, first of all, I want to kind of show you a few typical Koanozoans. I can, that didn't work. How about this one? Open. There we go. That's a, let's see if I can get this any larger. Yeah, this is a very typical Koanozoan. Uh, Koanozoan anatomy is gonna be very, very simple. It's probably the easiest thing we're going to be looking at all semester. Unfortunately, we don't have any Koanozoa at Northeastern on slides. So we're going to be dealing strictly with uh, some video, uh, some JPEGs here. So, okay. So this is a typical Koanozoa, as I said, if we bring it up. There's one flagellum here. Okay, a lot of people when they see this on a quiz say, well, there's three, there's this, this, and this. No, this is, these are not flagella. This is part of the cone. That's one of the edges of this nice little skirt that goes around here. Single flagellum. And what's the direction of travel? Anyone? This way or this way? Toward the flagellum or away from the flagellum? Away. Away. Good. So you're going away from the flagellum, okay? And so this is your direction forward. That means that you have this one flagellum in the back and it pushes uh, the organ, it's pushing the organism forward away from the flagellum. That is going to be one of our big distinguishing characteristics of our part of the eukaryotic tree. The flagellas on these guys, okay, are um, singular, okay. Most organisms, most eukaryotes uh, outside of our little area have two flagella or more. We're not accustomed to seeing that. But polyflagellate is not considered a normal condition or a typical thing in our heads because we haven't been introduced to it too very often. A lot of things have many flagella or many cilia. Single flagellum, okay, going through, okay, uh, puts you in a group called the unicanta, the, the one bodies. They've got one basal body to which the uh, flagellum is attached in, at the back of their, bot, at the back of their um, little hineys, okay. The, the, I'm, or I'm sorry, I take that back one basal body to which everything is attached um, in, in terms of the flagellum and only one flagellum. If it's at the hiney, okay, if it's at the back end and propelling it forward like an outboard motor, then it is in the opisthocons. Now, opistha is that root I don't think we've got a single cognate in English for. Uh, come, it's a Greek root and it basically means the rear. So if you've got a single flagellum at the rear, you're in the opisthocons. And that brings us into our neck of the woods, okay? We're now in our 
even smaller clade containing us. Our sisters, the fungi, are in that clade. Okay, so sister fungi are there. And then there's a few other little tiny clades of organisms that are in here, including the Philos amoeba. So if you look at the screen behind me, okay, you'll see the all of these little tiny things with these long projections coming out. This is a coanozoan, but it's one that has little Philos amoeboid-like extensions. Okay. So Anything in our body that kind of looks like that, that has long uh, pseudopods, philo pseudopods coming out as long, long extensions. A couple places. Well, think about neurons and the axons and dendrites of neurons or the pseudopods of um, some of the immune system cells. Natural killer cells, for example, make these long pseudopods and they literally attack the, uh, an, an infected cell using that extension. So this is a feature that we're gonna get inside of our area, inside of our opisthokontic area, but not from a direct relative. So who are we gonna get instead, okay? The, uh, we're gonna get one more little change here, which is we're around, we're gonna start to kind of limit those pseudopods. We're not gonna get as many of those things, but instead we're gonna start focusing on this flagellum. Now many of these guys will still be able to make those nice phyllo pseudopods, but this is gonna become much more prominent and this cone is gonna form around them. Now, what is the cone? It's a variation on the phyllo pseudopods, okay? They are just little finger-like extensions of cytoplasm, very, very fine, that just encircle the flagellum. The flagellum, in addition to uh, getting it to swim, acts kind of like a warring blender and stirs up the water in the area, and it literally creates a current going into and around and through those little finger-like extensions, okay? Think of this as tassel, like, uh, like fringe rather than as a solid. And those fringes start to just eat whatever might hapless bacteria and small particles might be in there. So this guy becomes a hunter by changing those little phyllo pseudopods into this, this cone of death, if you would, that surrounds the flagellum and the flagellum just creates the current that brings the food in. Oh, we have such wonderful origins. Now we need to have the qu uh, cute kitten video in the background to get over this, right? So um, that is what our, one of our most distant ancestors kind of looks like. Now I'd like to uh, show you what another member of that same group looks like. Okay, this guy is also in the group Coanozoa. The last one was a Coanozoan, this is a Coanozoan. But this one is a little bit more complex, at least by our definition of complexity. We really like multicellularism, you know, it's something about being a multicellular animal that uh, makes us relate to it. And um, this guy, okay, has the beginnings of cooperation, cellular cooperation. It's just this little blob and in that little blob you've got cells embedded and in those embedded cells you're going to have, um, in this case, some differentiation. Cells in the middle go back to a more amoeboid state. The ones on the outside are actively feeding and these guys actually get fed by the ones on the outside. That is cooperation, that is differentiation. But if you look at this, okay, and this is not just an artifact of the plane that you're looking at it through, because remember this is a three-dimensional thing. So these quantoflagellated cells on the outside are literally making up the sphere, okay. These guys are at multiple levels, you know, there's depth to it. Um, 
they're not, the ones on the inside at least are not in direct contact, okay? The ones on the outside do, are not necessarily cheek to jowl with each other either. Instead, they are embedding themselves in a matrix, okay? A matrix it, from our tissue lecture, matrices are the uh, non-fibrous stuff, okay, that makes up this non-living ground substance that uh, can bring uh, connective tissues together. So they are doing that. They've, they have this matrix. They also have fiber. They, act, they have collagen, okay? The, uh, collagen is a very animal thing to make. So they have uh, an animal-like uh, fiber inside their animal-like matrix because we uh, the, the compounds in there are similar to what we're going to find in sponges and other animals. They have cellular cooperation. They actually have this ability to form at least two type, cell types, uh, the coanoflagellated and more of an amoeboid version. They're beginning to have a lot of the characteristics that we associate with animals. So this is another ver version, and this is an one that just kind of forms not an internal area, but a um, just kind of a chain, almost like a filamentous algae. They're just making this little chain of coanoflagellated cells. So you can see here in this electron micrograph the flagellum here, and all the little fine pseudopods, if you would, or philopods would be a, uh, the this picky term that make up the the cone, okay? And they're just making this nice little chain, okay? Now there's they basically from the point of view of a pair of a protozoologist like myself, they're defective. They stick together. I mean, mitosis was supposed to break cells apart and send them on their separate way. We're now going to be studying for the rest of the class defective cells because they're going to start sticking together. So this is a good one. And we're going to see that, uh, some really hot off the press footage uh, within the last, just basically within the last month or so of a colony like this actually moving. And so from so basically from looking like this to just twisting itself, changing uh, into something like this, so they can actually control, okay, whether they're concave or convex relative to their flagellated cells. Now that's pretty, pretty cool. So let's start taking a look. Okay. Wanted to see, oh yes, this is another member of the group. And this is another opisthicon, but it's not a a quanocyte, uh, a quanoflagellate per se. But look at those really fine pseudopods; those are just so beautiful. So uh, let's go and let's take a look at uh, the uh, the lect the materials on this. I can get it over here now. So I'm going to run it this way so that we don't uh, have to listen to the to me talking. Uh, so we have the coanozoa. This is going to be our first phylum of animals. Okay. When we started looking at these guys, uh, about a, just over a hundred years ago, a little over a hundred years ago. They already noticed, people were already noticing the similarities between these and sponges. And it was proposed that maybe sponges had their origins in the Coanozoa. And then it went pretty much untested for the next, eh, you know, 100 years or so. And the, fairly recently with the DNA analysis tools, we've been able to go back and look at this again and say, I think, yeah, they, they really, this guy in the 19th century was, was correct. 
So uh, the last common origin with the other animals is about 800 million years ago. So it's three, over three quarters of a billion years ago. Given what we know about um, homo, uh, morphies and homoplasies, okay, we're gonna expect a lot of, a lot of change in DNA sequences, basically flip-flopping. We've only got four choices, right? And uh, so we, we have to be a little careful here, but uh, the data, we're looking for things like that are highly conserved, things like how things are linked together, uh, proteins that aren't showing up anywhere else but the animals. And when we start looking at this sort of thing, uh, we wind up with uh, these guys being the si sister, at least sister to all the other animals. The only reason, and it's, it's a matter of philosophy whether we put them into the animals or not. The only reason we typically do not put them in with the animals is that we have a bias towards multicellularism. So we got the Coanozoa, these wonderful little guys. They're part of the Unicanta, which is the Amoebozoa and the Opisthocanta. Okay. So one of the questions that people wanted to know in our origin story, our continuing origin story, is if there was any one particular clade of so-called protists that was a good candidate to be a sister to the animals, where something that might be similar to the organism that gave rise to the animals. And there were features that they wanted to see that everybody kind of wanted to look for. One of which is that they should resemble the most basal plesiomorphic groups of the animals in some non-trivial way, okay? So for example, their morphology, their biochemistry, or their physiology should in some way, shape, or form kind of resemble us. And uh, this could give us information about our last common ancestor of metazoan evolution. So what they've, we've come up with, somebody left us, okay. Um, so what we've come up with in terms of last common ancestors, okay, and the, the traits we want to see is on this slide, that we should be free living, ability to form colonies, eukaryotic, heterotrophic, uh, have a single nucleus and marine. Now virtually everything there is pretty straightforward, I hope, yeah. Um, extremely basic. There's a lot of stuff out there that meets these criteria. Well, let's also uh, look at a couple of other things, that things that are differentiate animals that all the animals seem to share that could help us differentiate among the myriad of stuff that would fit that description so far. One of them was actin and my, or, and or myosin, okay. We'd like our last common, in quote, protozoal ancestor, in other words, our last unicellular ancestor that we have in common to have uh, proteins that other uh, animals have that, that, that are shared in common throughout, uh, from the sponges on up. And one of the ones that we come up with is actin and myosin. Remember, animals were those things that moved. Actin and myosin are found from sp in sponges. They are found in whales. They're found in insects. They're found everywhere you look in the animal kingdom. Collagen 4. Collagen 4 is a, a very common thing within the animal world. It is not found outside of our world. There are certain linkage groups that we tend to share, some certain ancient linkage groups. At least the basal animals tend to share them. And uh, there's ultrastructural characteristics like that one trailing flagellum and the structure, the ultrastructure of the basal body of the flagellum. Uh, and things like nuclear protein, protein coding genes, mitochondrial genes that are being are highly conserved within the animals. We also want to see some of those things. So um, 
when you start looking across that whole old kingdom of the protists you know and the, the multiple kingdoms that we have among the protists today the one of these unified cells starts to pop out and that is the coanozoans so what about those protists okay those protists are again they, we've divided them into multiple kingdoms because they are so unlike each other uh, far more unlike each other than a lot of multicellular organisms are. So why pl put all the plants and fungi and animals together? Uh, you wouldn't think about doing that. So why put all the unicells together? So they've been doing their own evolutionary path far longer than we have. So we've got this huge unresolved polytomy at the base of the eukaryotic tree. And, but despite all this confusion, we one thing starts to pop out right away, and that is, again is our affinity with the with these guys, with the uh, coanoflagellates. Okay. So most organisms have either no flagellum or a trailing flagellum. Let's just going into this very quickly, um, and the we have only one okay all eukaryotes seem to be within six like super groups of of uh, organisms and again most of these multiple flagella or no flagella and these are those large overgroups okay here we are over here by the way the epistocanta the excavata has some really really funky mitochondrial stuff going on they're, they're very strange little creatures. Uh, this is a group off by themselves. These are the foraminifera. For those of you who are uh, not familiar with the foraminifera, they are testate amoeba. They, by testate, I mean they make a skeleton. They make a little shell that they live inside of. They're, and they're important in terms of forensic analysis for trying to figure out where some things came from in, that were exposed to sand or the ocean. Uh, radiolaria, they are a type of amoeba. Again, it's very easy to make a blob. So we're going to find amoeba scattered everywhere. And these just kind of um, have very, they have fine phyllos, uh, pseudopods as well, very fine needle-like ones. But, and this is a big but, okay, they are, have that shell around them. Chromo uh these are going to include things like the organisms that cause malaria, uh, cryptosporidia. They're also going to include the ciliates. So that they're off on their own. I'm not going to give anybody any points for figuring out who the archaeplastida is off the top of their head, because I'm going to assume you all know what a plastid is, right? Everyone? No one. No one knows what a plastid is. Plastid is an organelle you find in plants. Okay, it's one of the like a nucleus. It's it's a symbiont that came to dinner and stayed. Uh, chloroplasts are probably the most well known of them. Uh, but there's a number of different plastids in pl in plants. So this is where you're going to find the in the archae pl ancient plastida, the ancient plastid animal organisms, your plants, green algae, red algae, stuff like that. And that brings us to this last branch down here. If you look here at our tree, here's, here's the root for us. We're coming off. And everybody over here is a unicont, meaning everybody there, if they have, and sometimes when they have, because it gets, it sometimes gets lost in, uh, as, they're, as they're swimming around, uh, if they have a flagellum, it's a single flagellum. Our amoeba, who didn't read the rule book, and will actually sprout a flagellum and run away. So these guys are amoeba, but they tend to have big, what they call lobo pseudopods, larger pseudopods. And they're related to us distantly because the amoebozoa is the sister clade to the opisthocons. Okay, the opisthocons 
are the uh, our group. It's, this is our local group. And as you can see, one of our close relatives here now is the fungi. This is one of the reasons why when you eat mushrooms or and other fung fungus, it tastes kind of meat, can taste kind of meaty. It's going to share certain, uh, it has almost a meaty texture in some cases. It's sharing a fair number of proteins with us, okay? Enough to make it, give it the, some of these texture things that we really like. So here we are, we're the metazoa. Metazoa is a fancy term for all the animals other than the coanozoa. These, those are the multicellular animals, okay? So this, now we're getting into a matter of philosophy. Do we include the coanozoa as an animal or not? And some people say no, because it's not multicellular. Others say, but everything else points to it being an animal. Get over your basic prejudices here. Let it into the multicellular club uh, and put it in with us. And I'm in that latter category. So these guys are definitely very close relatives. This ichthyosporia are basically coanoflagellates that don't have the, co the cone, okay? They're, they're missing the cone and that's about it. They seem to be now a little bit further away than the coanoflagellates are. So let's see, unicons, da, 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 we, we've pretty much covered most of this already. So I want you to get used to a little uh, a set uh, theory, symbolism and uh, ways of new ways of thinking that remember when you're dealing with taxonomy, uh, we often talk about paraphyletic groupings as if they were real because uh, it's very helpful, it's very nice and uh, simplifying. However, and this is again a big but here, one of the problems we have when we do this is that um, it makes us sometimes forget that cladistically we're really looking at things that are embedded. It becomes n really a, sort of a Russian nesting doll effect. It's very hard to discuss things, very hard to talk about things when we're, when we're uh, talking about it, which is why we keep going back to these paraphyletic groupings uh, rather than just saying everybody is a coanoflagellate and going from there. So when we're looking at the eukaryotes, that is a super group. Everybody sees that little sideways U. Think of it as the traditional greater than arrow, okay? A little, everybody's familiar with greater than and less than arrows. This is just what you do when you've got a, a set instead of a, a number. Um, so the eukaryotes are the largest set. The unicons are embedded in the eukaryotes and the epistocons are embedded in the unicons. Now, another way we can talk about this a little bit is to talk about who is in the groups. And I apologize, I apparently I have a typo there. That's also. Um, when you're looking at the unicons, the unicons contain two sisters, the amoebozoa and the opisthocontus. So again, using set theory terminologies, we can either say that the amoebozoa, the unicons are equal to the set of the amoebozoa and the opisthocontus two elements in that set, or, and this is, again, this is gonna be absolutely equivalent. We could say the unicons are the amoebozoa united with, uh, with the opisthocons, okay? The union of the two sets. So your major takeaway so far, multicellular animals form a clade. They form a, what's a real honest to goodness clade with, with the fungi and uh, predominantly unicellular coanozoa. And all of these together are your opisthocons plus a few stragglers. Okay. Animals are so closely related to the coanozoa that you really can't really tell them apart from the animals except by looking that they've got one cell. 
they are closer to us than they are to any of those other one-celled creatures out there. You know, they are our cousins, not the cousins of the flagellates. I'm sorry, of the um, excavata, like euglena. They're not the cousins of something like plasmodium or paramecium. They're our cousins. We're going to claim them. So all of that similarities nowadays t has moved these things from a separate fi uh, kingdom over to the a phylum within the anima animalia. It's philosophical philosophy thing, I agree, but uh, we're going to treat them as a phylum of animals. Okay. Um, there is an, a new class uh, as well, uh, the Philisteria. It was not kind of kind of on that tree, but it's not exactly there. Uh, it fits in right next to us. Uh, these are the, the Phylozoa, and they've got tentacles that uh, aggregated like a paraciliary collar, but not quite, and they make these huge pseudopods, like right these guys behind me. Okay. Our tree shows the ichthyosporian coanozoans as sisters to the philozoa. And when you kind of put these together, you're going to start finding similarities in proteins again, like ubiquitin, uh, similarities with the small uh, subunit uh, prote protein genes that are going to have, unify them with the holozoa. Okay, so the, they're going to take the philozoa and they're going to start bringing it in with the animals and the uh, quanozoa. So when we look at this tree, okay, the animalia and the quanozoa are coming together and they look alike. They start to look so much alike on so many points, okay, of, of, of biochemical similarity. That's the, and the parsimonious explanation there, of course, is we have a common ancestor. Um, so this becomes our our tree. Okay, if we kind of just focus in on it a little bit, here's our ichthyosporia. These are kind of some of the philos guys are in there. Um, the quantiflagellates, the animalia, and the the philos amoeba are out here. These are a kind of philos. There are now, these used to be in with the quanozoa. They got split off because they're just enough, different enough not to put, to make them an out group. They're less like the quanozoa than the quanozoa are like us. Okay. So, uh, our epistocons are basically are a monophyletic grouping. Now, the closest relatives of the animals, including among the Quanozoa, we don't know. We don't have a, a clue which branch of these. And there's a, there's qu there's a quite a few Quanozoans out there. Um, But we don't know exactly who is our closest relative. We do know that there's a lot of things in common that they have with us, one of which is at that collar. Among the coanozoans, they have this little rigid internal support. Basically, they're bundles of actin. Gee, actin, what, what was that we wanted before? Oh, yes, we wanted to have actin in our last common ancestor. Now, they're not using actin the same way we do. We use actin as a part of the actin myosin complex to move muscles, right? To do this. Okay. Uh, now, they're using it more like we might use tubulin, you know, just as a support structure. Uh, so, they're like a microfilament. And uh, so, they're, but they've got this this protein that we, we then begin to repurpose. There's two, the two other lineages, there's ichthyosporia and the philasteria that have also been proposed as being our last common ancestor, but the molecular data is really, really weak on those. Okay, so this is kind of where we stand now. This is our current uh, idea 
of how organisms are related. So the coanoflagellates, notice that they've got them right smack in the animals now. If we come right here to this branching point to the node, uh, and I just moved the node, okay, if we come right to the branching point, the coanoflagellates is a, is a sister to the metazoa. Metazoa, those are the multicellular animals. That's going to be the placozoa, whom you probably never heard of. They're basically like giant masses of cells. Yeah, we did because we talked about them the other day. Uh, giant masses of cells that act like a multicellular amoeba. Um, the periphera, which are the phyla of, the sp of, funges, of sponges. And they're here. Then you've got our uh, philisteria. Those are the uh, philos amoeba. Think about your, at, how, um, what you call it? I lost my train of thought with the ding dong um, coming in, which you probably didn't hear. Uh, somebody comes in, I get a little ding dong in my ears. Um, so the philisteria, these are going to be things that have these long uh, pseudopods. We still do that. Our neurons have these, a lot of our immune system cells have this characteristic. You move out even further uh, away from the stuff that has the uh, phylos uh, amoeba, you can find some additional stuff uh, that we're, we're, not, we're not even gonna worry about, okay? Basically, when you get all of these together, you've got what's called the holozoa, everybody who's related to the animals, um, Within, on this branch of the epistocons, and then you wind up with the fungi being the more t most distant clade related within the epistocons to us. So that is the end of really that we just going through it very quickly. I'm hoping everybody had a chance to see it first and look at it first. Um, this is the end of the Coanozoa part uh, A. There's two parts to this lecture. So I'm going to uh, pause the recording at right now. We're going to go back very quickly, and just kind of review this again. Remember, it's all in those little audio clips as well. So if you're uh, lost, go back, go over this again with the audio clips. We're looking at the Coanozoa. We have a series of characteristics that we want to see in the last common ancestor of the multicellular animals, the metazoa, and the unicells that are most closely related to us. And this is a list of about 10, and some of them are pretty trivial, like we want it to be free living, not a parasite, because parasitism is kind of hard to give up once you get used to having a free lunch and a nice cushy place to live. So most, a lot of animals are not parasites, so we want a free living ancestor. We want to have, have be mononuclear because every cell we uh, is typically mononuclear. Uh, we lose that mononuclear state at times, like our muscle cells are multinuclear because we form a syncytium. And then we have some less t uh, trivial things, like we want to have compounds like actin and myosin, uh, things that you know let us move. Uh, we want to have similarities in uh, protein structures. We want to have linkage groups uh, within, the, uh, within the DNA. We'd like to see similarities in the mitochondrial genomes. And when we start to do this, we find that the animals and one particular group of what we used to call the protozoa join together to form this, uh, this single clade, the metazoa and the uh, coanozoa become very, very closely related. And then the only difference between the coanozoa and the multicellular animals comes out to be how many cells do you have. One ne never makes it past the colonial level of organization. The other has all sorts of linkages between cells and tissue differ differentiation that the coanozoa just don't ever quite get to. Okay. Everybody else 
from trees to malaria are and other branches of the of the uh, tree of eukaryotic life. Uh, oh, and of course we have the fungi. That's our, I'm sorry. There are, there are relatives as well. So, the big thing that united us first with the fungi. So everything up on this branch right here, as you're going out, has one flagellum. Okay, and we all think, myself included, when I hear one flagellum, I think of that as a natural state. But no, anybody on these other branches over here, if they're going to develop flagella, they're typically multiflagellate, okay? At least diflagellate. These guys are uniflagellate. And if that is a trailing flagellum, rather than one that's coming from its nose, it's coming out of its butt, okay? You have got a opisthocont. And I know that's a very intimidating sounding word, but opista simply means rear and conta is a body. Okay, so this is a rear body a flagellum. It, the anchor for it is at the rear of the body. So the flagella is anchored. It has its uh, centriole at the rear of the animal, whereas relative to the direction of travel rather than it coming out of its nose and out of the uh, front of the animal. And when we start looking at these, okay, fungi are, op are unicons, but they're not opisthocons. So they kind of branch off earlier. When you're looking at the unicons, we get the fungi are in there. The I'm sorry, I take it back. Uh, the fungi are opisthocons. Sorry, uh, the amoebozoa branch off earlier. Okay, they are the they're unicons, but they're not opisthocons. The fungi are definitely opisthocons, but they lack some of the the, the chemicals and the linkage groups that you find between the um, the uh, quanozoa and us. So think of the unicons; they're the amoeba. The amoebozoa, that's just the bulk of the amoeba, and then the opisthocons. Okay. We have chemical similarities with the quanozoa. We've got major chemical similarities with them in terms of a lot of different uh, linkage groups, but also in terms of regulatory proteins. Um, how many of you are, raise your hand if you're familiar with regulatory proteins, like homeobox and the like. One? Okay. What a regular, what a regulatory, uh, uh, I'm sorry, regulatory genes, my mistake, my bad. Uh, a regulatory gene does is it controls other genes. It's a sort of a master switch that, uh, you know the types of switches, you turn on one switch, all the lights in the room go on. That's what these do. So they, you switch that thing on and it will regulate other downstream events. So some of the big ones uh, for us are homeobox genes. We're gonna start talking about homeobox genes next week and uh, I think it's next week, not this week. And they're just everywhere, okay? And the ho Hox genes for short, it's, it's a big family that we would deal with. And, uh, there's two big groups that are kind of sort of unique to the animals and the coanozoa. And two of them are called, one's called hedgehog. Um, I am not making that up. You can't make stuff like this up. They, somebody decided it was be a good idea to call the regulatory gene hedgehog. Um, it's still better than Indy, okay? No, that was not a race car fan. It stands for I'm not dead yet. Okay. Uh, Indy was called Indy because there was an awful lot of uh, money given to early uh, ge genetics research investigating these kinds of genes by John Cleese. Okay. John Cleese was a big supporter of genetic research uh, for many, many years. Um, he's not dead yet, but uh, he, he has been a big supporter of it. And um, 
therefore, Indy was named for one of his more famous routines um, in, Mont in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. So, uh, but Hedgehog is, is the one that we're interested in here and Notch, okay? And they're very conserved, they're parsimonious, and uh, they're just kind of carried straight the, uh, straight through into the animal line from this ancestor. Okay. So when we start looking again at these guys, the animalia really has the coanoflagellates in them. Okay. We, they are part of us. And, uh, there's a lot of apomorphies uniting us. A few less apomorphies connecting us with the very fine thread uh, Philos amoeba. Fewer still bringing us in with the fungi and fewer still in with the amoeba. And that kind of brings us to this particular slide again. So let me do a quick pause here. And we're recording again now. We're starting off with the, the ancestral eukaryote with, and much larger text than I would like. Okay. I do not like this, so hang on. I'm going to go back to drawing mode. Go to draw. Okay, so we're gonna, there we go. The From the eukaryotes, we go to the unicons with all these other side branches, right? And down here it's from an, base of the tree of life. Okay, so from the eukaryote, uh, so we have this unicont branch. I've asked for a drawing tablet. What did I get? I got a computer. No, it's not even close. Um, unicont branch. The unicons break into the amoebozoa. And remember, it's badly named. It is not the same thing as the amoeba. There's a lot of amoeba scattered all over the place. The amoebozoa is one particular kind of amoeba, which we're not going to worry about, the, uh, the lobos amoebas. And then it, the opisthocont. Okay, the epistocons, the fungi breaks off. And you have this branch that leads towards the animals, which we call the holozoa. The holozoa, and this is not a, a, the best cladogram ever drawn because there should be not beautiful little branches everywhere. They're going to include the animalia. And the animalia includes the uh, coanozoans or not, depending on who you talk to, depending, we're including them in the animalia. Some people won't because they still really like that multicellular thing. But uh, there's that, and then the Philos amoeba. Or the Philozoa. Okay. 
And then there's a couple, again, small little clades floating around in there. Okay. Not the most beautifully written, but it should kind of bring you through. So let me, uh, I'm going to clear that. I'm going to save that. Uh, if I can get at it. I'm saving that so I'll be able to do, put it up as a PNG. And I'm going to close that. Uh, hold on. I'm recording. Okay. So let me go back just one slide. Uh, there's a lot of cell cooperation going on here. A lot of multicellular organisms that we, we need cooperation. Uh, we're going to share some of those genes that they talk about in the video below. Uh, we share the, these RTK genes. Uh, we talk about, we share cooperation systems. Coanozoans have uh, adhesion systems, calcium metabolism systems that are like our own. So there's a lot going on here. And Proterospongia, this is this one group that we uh, kind of looked at before earlier in the slides. Um, they're freshwater. They have uh, their colonial uh, part of their life cycle. Proterospongia, by the way, as a freshwater organism, is not really considered to be uh, in direct line. That ape, being freshwater is an apomorphism, so we know it's probably not. We're, we're pretty sure it's not really that close to the ancestor, but it's got a lot of traits we're looking for. Um, it's not, but it's not marine. Um, there's limited differentiation among the cells and there is some cell-to-cell uh, -cell cooperation. There's a lot of the molecular machinery already in place that is going to uh, be adapted to support multicellularity. Um, so we've kind of jerry-rigged what was going on in these guys to start, uh, jumpstart our multicellular systems. Um, we've got this common molecular uh, system, this, this, this common molecular heritage, but we're going to start using it differently. And in fact, even some of the coanozoa are going to start using things differently, like that actin. Actin is initially used mainly as a support protein for the uh, microvilli. Some of these guys and animals start to use it along with myosin and actually start to use it for uh, motion and motion of, among members of a colony. Okay, so where are we? This is kind of pretty much where we're standing. We've got the coanoflagellate, we're, we're in this dark purple area over here. The coanoflagellates are kind of towards the base here. The amoebozoa are our outgroup for the fungi and the hol holozoa, our guys. We have the coanozoa towards the base, periphera, and something called a placozoa, which we talked about briefly last time, coming off the, as well. And then we have the uh, animals proper, the, the what we normally think of as animals at, beyond that. Okay, so uh, where do we find coanozoas? You find them in most aquatic systems. Uh, they are you have marine coanoflagellates and you have freshwater coanoflagellates. The colonies when you get them they can be plate-like or they can be spherical or they can be just linear chains. Okay. Um, Colonial forms tend to, can have outer and inner surfaces. Uh, there's one called Coanoica flexa, 
which we're going to see in a moment, has actually learned how to use its actin to move. Okay, it's no longer just a support protein. Uh, it's it, it's going to be changing its orientation, basically from something like this to something like this, in order to create the something that looks a little bit like a cavity between two uh, between a layer of cells. Uh, some unicellular forms are also going to have this uh, sheath that's rich in collagen, and again, collagen is this animal uh, protein. Okay, so this is the one I was telling you about. Look at this. Just watch this for a moment. This thing is using its contractile proteins like an animal would. So f follow the, fl the flag flagellar surface. It goes from the outside to the inside. Once it goes from this almost ball-like form with the flagella on the outside, start that over again, to the form with the flagella on the inside forming a depression around them, you have something that's almost indistinguishable from a sponge. There's, at least at the gross level, this thing becomes sponge-like. This is what's how sponges behave. They have this, okay, this here, let's go a little bit further. Open. This is a quick flip. Okay, this is almost sponge-like. Just make it a little tighter and you've got uh, something that you could very have, you'd have a lot of time telling apart from your a basic sponge. You just need a few little support structures in your home. So uh, this, and sponges don't move as, as quickly or as gracefully as this guy does. Okay, by the way, that really is hot off the presses from just last fall. So, Reproduction, or, or doing the physiology right now, your reproduction, that is coming straight um, from binary fission. Up until a year ago, I would have said these guys do, by, or two years ago, I would have said binary fission only. We've never seen reproduction. Well, in 2017, they made a liar out of me. They finally saw sexual reproduction, and they saw it by accident. They've been looking for sex in this thing for years, because Virtually every animal has sex. So, uh, where sex has been lost, it's considered an apomorphism within a clade. So uh, we wanted our last common ancestor to have sex. We, we couldn't find it. We couldn't find it. We figured it had to be there somewhere. We finally found it in 2017 when we were looking at feeding, okay, and just happened to see sex. Uh, so it had so probably just went unnoticed. And uh, we got it now. So that's another check in the box of the, uh, yeah, something in common with the animals. Okay. Now when it had sex, it was, didn't, as far as I know, I believe it was a, uh, it was one form of gamete. It was, they, they, it wasn't a sperm and egg, but I think they were isogametes, but I'm not positive on that one. So why did they find it when they were having, uh, when they were doing feeding studies? It turned out sex was induced by food, okay? It's kind of like the box of chocolate, you know, putting, in the, putting you in the mood or the nice dinner. They like uh, bacteria. And if, if when they were, we were trying to find sex without giving them what they wanted. So for them, food feeding is foreplay. We gave them the bacteria. They started uh, having sex. So, uh, so the relationship of the coanoflagellates to the periphera. This is a point that has been 
would never have been considered controversial up until a few years ago when somebody wrote a paper that I'm convinced was just done to get tenure or just to get out of graduate school by saying something new because it was crazy, but you don't uh, get uh, a tenure by saying something that everybody has agreed upon for years. You get it at a major place by saying something new. And uh, so somebody challenged this. The, the challenge is now being pushed to the side and saying, okay, the guy was crazy. We're, we don't, we're not going to worry about it. He was off on a, a wrong track. But what is the relationship then between the quantiflagellates and the periphera? From a morphological form, a purely morphological form, this goes back to the latter part of the 19th century. They recognized there were similarities. They're almost identical in shape and function to a type of cell called a coanocyte that you find in the sponges. Okay, so uh, the collar cell or the coanocyte is morphologically virtually indistinguishable. You take a single coanocyte from a sponge, you take a coanoflagellate, uh, you can really not tell them apart. The cells generate a current that draws water and food particles through the body of the sponge and they filter out food particles with their microvilli. They're do using them for exactly the same function as you find in the coanozoa. And when you start looking at their molecular similarities, uh, one of the favorite places to look for is the ADS ribosomes and the genes that make the ADS ribosomes. They have, uh, they provide independent evidence for the sim uh, connection between the phyla because they have a lot of the sim uh, same linkage groups and they have a lot of the same, um, the genes within the, the ADS ribosome DNA. So again, this was proposed way back in the mid um, 19th century. Uh, Desjardins, uh, a French biologist, uh, uh, he was interested in protozoan evolution. He came across these things and said, hey, they look like sponges. Maybe this is where animals came from. But there was no independent evidence other than, hey, they kind of look interesting up until the late 20th and early 21st century when we began to really be able to look at the molecular biology of these things. Um, pr even as late as the 1980s, doing molecular biology was a really, really bad, really, really painful. You did not want to do that. Um, so uh, we had this uh, many linking sequences here we've got nuclear protein coding genes, we've got mitochondrial genomes, we've got ribosomal genomes, all of which pointing towards the idea that um, these genes are, uh, I'm sorry, that these or sponges are related to the coanozoa. Then you have a lot of uh, relationships between these guys in terms of these mitochondrial genomes. Uh, mitochondria, as you know, they are, they tend to be a single genome. There's not, we don't get a lot of, as far as we know, a lot of gene swapping going on. So that's a nice thing that to look at. People have been really, really focused on mitochondrial genomes. And uh, they confirm the placement of the quantiflagellates as this outgroup to the metazoa, the multicellular animals. And they also negated the possibility that the quantozoans simply were degenerate, they, that they evolved from metazoans and uh, became less complicated over time. So are they animals? Are they animals or not? This is really a matter of philosophy. Uh, we will consider them to be a phylum within the animals for now. You're gonna come across older texts and other people though, who still see them as a separate kingdom mainly because they're not multicellular. How can I say prejudices die hard? And, um, but based on recent data, this is quite true. Multicellular animals lie inside the greater clay coanoflagellata, okay? You, so get in touch with your inner uh, ichthyosporin and coanoflagellate. Um, we share an, an ancestor with the ichthyospora, we do not let them into the club yet. Um, they, they're further back, they're not as, 
as closely related to us as these guys are. And the farther back in time we travel, we find common ancestors again with the fungi, at least uh, two other clades of amoeba. The first one, the, the, uh, the philos amoeba, very close. Uh, they make those fine pseudopods, and then you have those amoebozoans who are outside, uh, th that are unicons, but outside the epistocons that make the more lobos, broader ones. So um, here we kind of looked at the morphology. Uh, we looked at the similarities to the periphera. And we looked at some of the variety within the Quanazoa. We began to see that the periphera, it's the next step, is going to have its origins here. So we're going to continue from here into 2C. Oh, I guess there is a 2C. I thought there was only to 2B. Um, and we're going to go into the periphery from this point. Okay. So hang on, I'm going to st uh, Okay. So the uh, question that came up is about sex and the, the uh, Kwanazoa. We haven't we've seen it in a lot of Coanozoa yet. We've really just kind of started looking at it. Um, we've just found it recently in one species. That doesn't mean it's not in others. We just found it under very oddball circumstances. Turned out they have to be eating in order to be sexy in that species. So another group that we never saw it in until basically around 2011, 2012, um, as I remember being at a hearing about it while I was sitting at, at a uh, car repair store, it was very strange, is this guy. This is a, these are Placozoa, okay? That is a Placozoan. Uh, we mentioned them briefly the other day when we were doing our major survey. They're very simple, they have fewer cell types than sponges do. They are basically a layer of cells on the outside, a layer of cells on the, uh, excuse me, a layer of cells on the top, a layer of cells on the bottom that are differentiated. Um, they got a differentiated type of cells that kind of act like a zipper around the sides that have different kinds of senses in them. And there's cells in the middle that act uh, Almost, almost like a nervous system, in that they, they're, there's actually syncytical masses that connect the top and the bottom layers, and we think they're, they're playing a role in coordination, because we're finding transmitters that are similar uh, to neurotransmitters. These guys, again, we never saw them have sex. We thought they might be asexual. And then somebody tried this, a simple experiment and proved, yes, they actually are sexy. They took two population. We still haven't seen sex in them, but we know they have sex. So how? Take two populations. You, uh, t you do the genetic analysis on, on, on both. Basically, you, you get two clones. Clone A, clone B. You've got the DNA analyzed here. You got the DNA analyzed here. You put them together, and what do you look for? Genetic exchange. That's basically the definition of sex, right? You've got genetic exchange going on. And lo and behold, they had genetic exchange. They were sex. They were sexy. They had sex. They were able to d make gametes and do uh, recombination. So we've I identified recombination in them. Therefore, we know that they have sex. We've seen things that we think might uh, we think are eggs. We have a suspicion where the sperm might be, but we haven't actually observed. Uh, fertilization. In, so this is an this guy is in the same category. 
Now, skipping ahead about a month, month and a half, we've got another group. Which I just misspelled. The deloid rotifers. The B is silent, which is a phrase I bet you never thought you'd hear in your life. But the del these are little guys. They live in moss. While the weather's still nice, I encourage you to go out, get some moss, put it under your little microscopes, and look at what you've got. What you've got. Uh, it, there's an amazing world just in a little piece of moss. And these are the moss. Um, rotifers. Okay. This is what you're going to see, something that looks kind of like this one. Okay. And you can identify them almost immediately because they move like an inchworm when, when they're crawling. They're beautiful. Now the deloids, they don't have sex. And we've never seen them having sex. But also when we look at their genomes, there's no evidence of any kind of recombination going on for the last 40 million years. Now, I don't care how you put it, that is what you call a dry spell, okay? That is a long time to go without sex. So how do we look at this guy and, and say, how can we use it, okay? What is it that allows them to survive without sex because they're not doing reshuffling their genes, they're not doing these recombinations that we assume are very important in uh, both in predator prey relationships and in survival of diseases. So, what's going on? Well, first of all, we they, because they don't haven't had sex for so long. They've had no genetic recombination for so long. They can serve as great model organisms for explaining the functions of sex. Okay, we've got all these great ideas about why we have sex, but really we need a something outside the uh, s sexual sphere to really test some of these ideas. I think this way, this way, this way, whatever. At any rate, this guy is one of the organisms that we can use as a model organism to test theories about uh, the functions of genetic recombination. Because when you think about it, genetic recombination is a very strange way to reproduce on the surface. You only get, every time you do it, you only get to pass on half your genes, not all, your whole gene set. And you've got, to you've got to find a mate. You've got to spend time finding the mate. There's effort involved, you know, why is it the dominant form of, of reproduction within uh, animals and plants and fungi? Why is so much effort put into sex? Even protists, there are some protists that if they don't have sex every so often, they, they develop something called clonal senescence, and they start to die. Sex seems to be important, why? An organism like this can start to give us some clues. Uh, one of the th ideas that have come out of this is because when we start looking at it and other things that are short term less sexy, uh, things that can uh, under certain conditions go asexual, is that asexual species tend to do well in extreme environments where, where recombination might make you less fit for survival. So high mountains, uh, Moss is very extreme. Think about the incredible heat, the, the, the moisture at some times, drying out. And so uh, we, when we look at moss organisms, we find a lot that are at least facultatively asexual, uh, asexually able to reproduce. So, uh, so the deloids are an important group. The placozoa, which we're going to be getting into basically uh, probably week next week or the week after, important group. And uh, by the way, the placozoa, we're not exactly sure where they fit. Okay, this is one of those things that are kind of an embarrassment to us because uh, what do we, how do you, it's got some features that are some easy, simpler than those that you find in a sponge, others that are more derived than you find in a sponge. 
So we're going to have some fun trying to uh, figure out exactly where this thing goes. But binary fission is a very common way for this thing to, to reproduce. Okay, I'm going to stop the share. Actually, I'm going to stop the uh, resume recording. There we go. So with the projects, if, you, if you're interested in like a, just a random group assignment, that's great. But because you don't have a lot of um, familiarity with the different file and all the bizarre stuff that's out there, I really encourage you to go to that Ask Nature and just have fun exploring it. And also try to think of a problem that is out there, something that has just bothered you that there's no easy solution to it. Uh, not world peace. That's there's never going to be an easy solution for that one. But uh, you know, pick up some thing that uh, has. Why doesn't somebody come up with something for this, or some technological problem you're aware of, and then try to go to the animals and see what has any of them followed it, uh, solved this. Um, I'll give you a good example. Hang on, I'm going to uh, see if I can do this now without. There's got to be an easy way I can start putting up a draw a drawing board, and I don't see any easy way to do. Ever wonder why they make those big bricks with holes rather than solid? It's not just to save uh, money on materials. Those holes actually do something. They make it uh, stronger, believe it or not, uh, because it is changing how the materials are actually in relationship to each other. Well, a similar thing happens with an animal who's got a body cavity. The body cavity actually helps not just reduce the weight of the animal because of less materials, but it makes it, in the case of the animal, there's this flexible coating now on either side of that cavity that can do things that it couldn't do when it was a solid. Uh, another example um, here is like a banana. I want you to think of a banana leaf and a lot of plant leaves for that matter, but it's so exaggerated in the banana. When you look at the petiole of the stem, it's like a half moon. I mean, it's just this crescent or a crescent moon. The middle is all scooped out. Well, why is that? It allows for f this thing to flex without breaking, okay, when the winds come. Now you can twist this thing more, okay, because of that scooped out area. Um, rather, which works so much better than the solid when you're dealing with a, uh, a moderate wind, okay. The, the banana leaves, they tear along specific planes that are uh, designed for fracturing so they don't lose their leaves. These are technologies that can be very, very handy for humans. So some of these people who've done this project have come up with phenomenal ideas, absolutely great ideas in the past, um, but I can't tell you about them. Be, sorry, you know, those ideas, I, as I say, they're, they're a million dollar idea. I'm not going to tell anybody about it. But there's a couple that have done it and I'm going, why couldn't I have thought of that? I hope that they follow through on them because literally one of the two, at least two of them, if they were to get it out to market, you know, could really, really do a wonderful job. Uh, if they don't get it to market, they're going to be sitting back someday seeing it by somebody else coming up with the same idea and really kicking themselves. So I'm going to give you your other big marketing tip, you know, your takeaway message for the day here. Let's say you come up with a million dollar idea. Of course, you're not going to share your million dollar idea directly with everybody in the class, right? You're going to give, you know, some of it, but you may not give away your, your really cool idea. Um, but you now bring it to market. Let's say you have a way of producing a better fiber optic cable than anybody else because you, you have studied sponges and the, the fiber optics of sponges and you beat them to it. You got this, this cable. So let's just say it is uh, 
company X that takes your idea because they got the better lawyers. They figure you can't do anything. And they're right. You cannot beat them in court. Okay. They've got people on retainer that you couldn't even hope to have. So what do you do? The way you get around it is you, when, before you bring something to market, before you even patent it, before you introduce anybody to this idea, know who your worst co competitor nightmares are. In this case, X has got to be hopefully one of them. But then you also have Y. So X is going after, is, is, is pirating your patent. You sell your patent to Y. You lose your patent, but now their lawyers are going to fight. And they'll have the actual patent, so they will win and they will uh, put X in its proper place at the bottom of the pecking order, hopefully beneath your foot where you're, while you're laughing. Um, so there, when you get into the businesses, it's cutthroat. There's a lot, for very good reasons, there's a lot of sociopaths in business. Uh, they do very well in the, in the market economy. So you've got to, uh, when you get a good idea, you've got to be careful with it. Hi, I forgot to start the video up again at the end of the last unit um, or after the break. So I'm kind of going back and giving the first part of this lecture again for you. So let's take a look at 2B quickly. And uh, we went through this pretty quickly. The unicons versus the epithecons. We can start talking about them as subdomains and super kingdoms, but the important thing is that you're looking at who's fitting into who. Think of them as a series of Russian nesting dolls. You got the unicons, somewhere inside the unicons, you have the epithecons, somewhere else you have the amoebozoa. So you've got the unicons and the amoebozoa. Then you have the, um, we're in the opisthicons, the, and that group, a group called the holozoa is going to be in there. The holozoa is going to include those phylos amoeba and the animals, the coanozoa and the metazoa, metazoa being every animal except the coanozoa. So um, we're now looking at uh, the origins of the multicellular organisms and the, basically the physical anatomy of the coanozoa. Okay? So what used to be the kingdom coanozoa has become the phylum coanozoa. Um, and let me just share the screen here with you. Uh, and I think that I'm hopefully I will get this to you. Let's see, share. I'm hoping you're seeing this. Um, so the Coanozoa, I think think this, yeah, I've seen the little green line around it. Good. So the Coanozoa are going to have a number of different classes and whatnot inside of them. There's a bunch of different groups. They're going to, the ones we're interested in have a collar. They're going to have a free swimming phase somewhere in there. They're going to be able to trap food against the collar. Now, don't think of that collar as a solid like 19th century anatomist did. That collar for us Okay, is a, um, let's see if we can get this a little larger. Uh, okay, I think that's better. Uh, I don't know if that's larger or not for you. It's larger for me. Okay, so they thought of it as a solid uh, cone, hence coanoflagellate. What it really is is a series of little finger-like projections. Each of those little finger-like projections has a skeleton in it. Basically, now we would use something like tubulin. They're using actin. Okay, actin for them, for the most of them, is simply going to be a structural protein that you use to to support these little fingers that are going to be used for feeding. Very tiny phagocytosis, um, and it's true phagocytosis because they're taking in whole organisms like bacteria. Um, 
many of them are going to have shells. They're called lorico or uh, tests. A test is a non-moving skeleton, and they're going to be made out of silica. Now, we like that they're made out of silica because most sponges also have skeletons made out of silica. So this is a good indication that the silica skeleton is plesiomorphic to a, a uh, form and that the calcium-based sponges are going to come later. Okay, And a lot of these guys are colonial. Well, let me rephrase that. Some of these guys are colonial. There's enough to make them of interest. So this is a 19th century drawing of these things. And these are little particles that you see here are being pulled upward by the uh, the spinning flagellum, which has actually got this sinusoidal wave going through it. And they see these particles getting stuck on this thing. They're, what they're not seeing, and you, I'm amazed that they saw as much as they did with the scopes they had. But what they're not showing is that these, this collar is really just the series of these little fingers coming out. Okay. This is one of those little tests or lorica that we were looking at. And how absolutely stunningly beautiful that thing is. It, it, it's gorgeous. That piece of artwork was made by a one-celled organism. It's amazing. And so this is the coanoflagellates. It's very plesiomorphic to other animals, meaning that it retains more of the traits of our last common ancestor than other animals do. Uh, now, how big are these things? If you look in the lower right corner here, you see a bunch of little uh, quantoflagellates stuck on some kind of a filamentous algae. Uh, I can't tell what kind it is. I'm not much of a plant person personally or an algae person, but I'm looking at that and I'm going, it looks like it might be Spirogyra or one of its relatives. And look at that, how many of these cells can fit in a row along one side of that algae. I mean, three, four cells can get onto one cell. So these are, can be very tiny. Um, the one on Monosega on the uh, far left, you can actually see the, the cone and the one single flagellum down the middle. So the front end where the, I've got the cursor going up and down is right here. Here's the back end, and the flagella is going out its hiney. Why is the flagella going out its hiney? It's, why is the single flagella going out its hiney? Because it's an opisthocont. Okay. Opisthocons have a single trailing flagella going out of their hiney. Okay. So the direction of movement is going to be away from the flagellum. That sounds easy, but it is very unusual for a lot of of, for, or for most animals, uh, for most organisms. Most, if they're going to have two or more flagella, if they're going to have a flagellum at all, and it's going to be typically anterior rather than posterior in its uh, origin. So this is important right here, this slide, because this is the anatomy of one of these guys, the basic anatomy. Easiest lecture and point I make all semester, it just gets worse from here for the anatomy because it's this one's simple. You got a cell body, you got a collar and your flagellum, period. That's it. Okay. Uh, cell body is where you put everything, you're just like you do on a neuron, the nerve cell body. That's where you can have your nucleus, you're going to have all your metabolic equipment, the collar. I know it looks like a, a solid skirt, you know, a, a, but it's actually just a bunch of these microvilli coming down. And then the flagellum is in the middle and you can see this one making the sinusoidal wave. And that sinusoidal wave goes the length of the flagellum. Okay. Here's another one of those absolutely gorgeous tests uh, uh, the, or skeletons for one of these things. Uh, this particular um, one belongs to a creature called a Canthaceca. Acantho means spiny. Theca is a house. So acanthotheca. And they just kind of ran the words together and they had a collision in the middle. 
the other nice thing is that when you look at a skeleton like this, again, there's silica, not calcium, which is what most sponges do. So the image of the species Monosiga uh, over here, it sh very clearly shows the collar, it shows the flagellum, and it bears a lot, and I mean an awful lot of similarities to a, a cell called a coanocyte that you find in the periphera. I mean, you put the two side by side, you'd have a lot of trouble telling them apart. You'd pretty much have to do DNA analysis to figure out who's who. Now, when I'm looking at it, this is the actual cell right here, the dark area. This halo on the outside is simply a, 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 an artifact of the microscope. It's the light, okay? This is a TEM of another species. And please, I don't get bogged down on what all the different vesicles and organelles are down here. Um, just look at this one right here at the base of the flagellum. That's called a basal body. There's one nice basal body at the base of the flagellum, and that's a pattern you're going to see straight through uh, all the animals as well. Okay. This is a organism, uh, again, we, yeah, sorry. We already saw, oh, it's the text. Sorry, the text is different. Um, some of these guys will have a sessil phase. They're not always free swimming. And what's nice about the sessile phase is that if you're not putting all that power into moving, you're putting that power into some, you can put that power into something else in that case, creating a stronger current, just bringing food up to you. So this aids actually in feeding to be able to hunker down and, and just sit there. So the villi are gonna filter out bacteria, other tiny food particles that are brought to them by the uh, current created by the flagellum, okay? This is Proterospongia. Proterospongia is, <clears throat> as the name suggests, something that's kind of on its way to becoming a sponge. It's got a lot of differentiation on the inside. It has, um, different kinds of internal cells, but it doesn't have connections between the cells. They're all in goo, okay? They're all in matrix that has a very animal-like in its nature. They've got collagen, which is an animal protein. Uh, the ones on the inside become very amoeboid, and therefore they've, you've got rudimentary differentiation uh, and cooperation between these cells, even though they're not firmly rooted to each other like they are in all other animals. Here's a couple more of these guys. This is another of uh, Proterospongia, and it, this is a, a smaller version, just uh, fewer cells at this point in its life cycle. And you're looking at the outside of the animal. You can just barely see something that might be the inside, but is much more likely to be just the another coanoflagellated cell that's out of focus. And on this little guy over here, you can see an individual cell from a uh, proterospongia. Proterospongia are not always um, colonial at all times. They can break up and form new colonies. And this guy, uh, you can see very clearly the collar and the flagella. Well, on this picture, I'd say you can see more of the collar, less less clearly the flagellum. Okay. And this is a Codosiga. Codosiga is another colonial one, but it's not as well organized as Proterospongia. If we look at Proterospongia, okay, nice diagram, actual organism. You can see that we don't have the um, differentiation we have in, uh, in uh, Proterospongia. These are just guys that are sticking together. So when they divide, rather than just going off, they're hanging out together as a colony. It's, made, it's making them bigger. First of all, that's gonna make them harder to eat because smaller things can't eat them now as readily because they, they're bigger. Um, and, but they can possibly do things and invade niches as a group that they may not be able to do as an individual. This is another relative of uh, Proterospongia. And um, 
We're not even sure if it's a separate species. Genetically, they're really very close together. Do they cooperate? Multicellular organisms like animals, they need to cooperate. Uh, so do they actually cooperate? The answer is maybe, okay. And the evidence for that comes into a, a form of receptors. Those receptors are things like the RTK receptor, tyrosine kinase, okay. Uh, that cohesion and adhesion systems for cellular communication and uh, sticking together and also genes involved in morphogenesis. Now at this point, we watched this YouTube video. And after we watched the YouTube video, I remembered to actually pick up and record the second half of the lecture. So that is what we did while you were away uh, because I was an idiot today. <clears throat> At any rate, the last part of the class, people had an open discussion about what to do for their projects. Uh, we, they talked about, I walked away and gave them some privacy doing this, uh, but they pretty much talked about uh, what kind of projects were and what kind of, uh, what they might want to do. And I came back and they told me that's what they sort of talked about. And they wanted to go into random groups because they didn't know each other. What I think I'm going to do is give people one more chance to get to know each other and then assign groups if nobody really wants to come together for, uh, to work together as a particular unit. The groups are only gonna be about three people, maybe four people in size, that's it. Any larger, somebody stops uh, working and lets somebody else do uh, all the work. So three, four people, maximum size for small group projects. Um, and we talked a little about, about some sample projects that what might be out there. We talked about spider silk as a, um, something that people have been investigating because of its tensile strength. We talked about, um, uh, what was it? Some of the other ones. Spider silk was the big one. Oh, cars that could use uh, be like a chameleon and change color like a chameleon or like a octopus can do, okay? Um, turned out that one is, has been taken and it is proprietary uh, technology with the military. Uh, we talked about think polishes like nail polishes that could change color in UV, kind of like, um, chlorophyll changes color or plants change color depending upon how much uh, UV light they're exposed to. They do it by adding pigments. Um, the nail polish does it by exciting molecules. You don't have to be able to do, uh, bring it to market. All you need to do is a sort of a proof of concept idea hey, this is how these organisms can do this particular technology, okay? Like, the, uh, like a uh, mosquito. So let me see if I can get a mis this going here. I'm gonna try to bring the uh, camera online. Okay, and I'm gonna bring in, uh, not the modic, sorry, the other camera. And I wanna kinda of just show you some of the, this is by the way, what your camera can do with the S, letter S, E, Y, E. I have posted the link. This is from this little, like this little cheap camera that I got that I kind of shared with you. Okay, except it works better if you got it on a flat surface, <clears throat> which I don't at the moment. So let me start with the, I, cause I think I did not share this with you. I think I forgot the camera at the beginning too, or it didn't start. 
so there we go. So if you were not there, okay, at the beginning, that is a male mosquito. Um, male mosquitoes are part of the diptera. So these are your first two insect orders, or your first insect order, by the way, today. Two, no, sorry, you're right, two insect orders. Um, diptera are the animal, the insects that have two wings, okay? And you can see the two wings here, you know, uh, right? Or they only have two wings, they don't have four wings like everybody else, so they have one pair of wings. That's the first wing, and there's the halter. That's the, what's left of the, the rear wing. So they basically have a vestigial rear wing. This is left halter, there's his right halter. Here is his wing. Now, how do I know that's a mosquito and not a midge or some other critter? Um, first of all, his body form. Okay. They tend to be very elongated, narrow insects with the head kind of downward. But I want you to look at the at the wing there. When you've got that body form, and then you've got the wings with veins that have all these little hairs on them, there's a good chance you've got a mosquito. That is like the hallmark of a mosquito, uh, family Culicidae. But it is it's a diptera order diptera because it has the halter rather than a rear wing and it's el uh, that's that puts it right into the diptera it's a mosquito because of its elongated body form and its hairy wings hairy veins on the wing now this is a male mosquito okay it's a i know it's a male because of the antenna and it, actually there is a tie into the project uh, the Male mosquito tries to find female mosquitoes, hunts for them by scent, not by, by uh, vision. Uh, their vision is actually pretty limited in terms of distance and range because of something called the lens maker's equation, which says, you know, the lens has to be so big to see so far clearly, and they, they got pretty tiny eyes. So they're hunting by scent. And this guy has huge, huge brushes coming off the antenna, not so much to find food, but to find, find females, okay? He's looking for a mate, uh, or he's looking to mate. You know, they're gonna pr uh, mate multiple times. So there's the, this is a male mosquito. Now, first of all, this is an incredible chemosensory device. Imagine have, being able to have chemosensory devices with this kind of precision, say in a meat packing plant, okay? But it's sniffing out E. coli on meat rather than uh, female mosquito scent. We could do an, or bomb detection, okay? Being able to sniff out plastique with something like this great, great possibilities for this kind of uh, structure. Or let's look at it again. You've got to have a balancing act here between the air moving through this thing, so being open enough for air to go through the antenna so you can get the scent, and being too fluffy so that every time you catch the wind, you, you, uh, get blown off course because it acts like a barrier uh, rather than as a filter. So one area where mosquitoes can teach us. This guy's mouth is not as sophisticated as his lady friends, but it's still pretty interesting. His lady friend has a proboscis, and we all know this if we've ever, ever been bitten by a mosquito. They can land on you without alerting you, because, partially because they distribute their weight with those long legs. Okay. Those massively long legs distribute the weights on the female for the female. Uh, he doesn't bite. He's a very friendly, peaceful vegetarian. She only bites when she has to, babies to take care of. So, um, but she'll land on you and she'll distribute her weight. Well, that's pretty easy. We figured that one out a long time. But then she has a hypodermic needle 
that can go into you, literally go in between cells, uh, to just really very finely, get in there without you feeling it. It's so, so sharp and so fast. And then she's got these two side things that come up, basically a sheath that covers that proboscis. It's pulled up and as she pulls out, they go back down so she doesn't lose a drop, okay? But that, that she, hypodermic, okay, is incredible, okay? They've actually designed hypodermic needles based upon this serrated tip, this very fine micro serrated tip of the female mosquito and they are able to reduce the pain of an injection dramatically, okay? So why aren't they in more common use? They're expensive, okay? They're expensive, they don't wanna uh, put a, shell out a lot of money for them, okay? So we, we're for something as minor as a, as a needle stick, okay? So what else? In addition to having that superpower of being able to land on you and feed on uh, your blood without you detecting them, uh, they also have another one. They can fly in the rain. You've got drops of water hitting them that are probably weigh as much as they do at high velocity. They should be splat on the ground, little ex mosquitoes, and yet they continue to fly in, in rain. How do they do it? Turns out, um, that those little hairs on the wings and the hairs on the bodies help break the surface tension of each of those drops of water. And the water basically moves around their bodies. And they literally just kind of fly right through the raindrop and keep on going. These are marvels of nature, absolute marvels of nature. So this is an, another, I point where you might find some ideas that you want to explore for your paper, okay? The other critter we looked at before I had the uh, common sense, God gave a goose and turned the computer camera on was this guy. And we did this one just kind of for fun. So you could, I could say, yes, you've had two orders of insects today. That is the order Siphonoptera, the flea, okay? One of the, probably one of the most deadly animals on the planet after the mosquito. Um, this is the this is not the one that carries the black plague though, as far as we know, this one does not. This is the cat flea, okay? But fleas are relatives of flies and the, uh, they, but they have lost their wings. This is a secondary loss. It's not a primary, but a secondary loss in uh, as they've evolved. They tend to be laterally flattened, okay? So meaning that the, the right and left side are smooshed together. And they've, they've got pretty powerful legs for jumping and, and the hind legs. But look at the face. The face on this guy is pretty impressive. It's almost cute you know, for something that can be so damaging. It's, it's adorable. Um, notice this comb right here. The comb is at the back of a segment of the uh, body we call the pronotum. So we, all, we call that comb the pronotal comb. The one that looks like a mustache down here is coming off the cheeks of the animal, which are called the jenna. So this is the genial comb, okay? So the pronotal and the genital combs. Now, I can't tell you what species this is uh, because, uh, because just from the information that we have here, but I can give you, uh, but I can tell you that if I could see the location of one other item, which is a keta on the face. Now, keta is a hair, so, these are all Kita here. These bristles down here are Kita. The little mustaches, a bunch of little Kita. If I knew the position of one other bristles, I could tell if it was a human flea or a cat flea. Um, actually, no, I take it back. The human flea looks like the rat flea, not like this one. Yeah, I can tell you what the species is on this one. 
uh, this is called tennis, uh, the genus is Tenocephalus. Okay, so Tenocephalus is the cat flea, Tenocephalus uh, felis, okay, the cat flea. And how do I know it's not a dog flea? Well, we don't have dog fleas in North America. If your dog has fleas, he's got cat fleas. I don't live with it. Uh, it's a cat flea. Uh, dog fleas are pretty much East Asia, uh, or an East, I'm sorry, East, Western Asia and Eastern Europe, I think are the two places we you see most of them. But this is a cat flea, Tenocephalus, the genus. So the important part though, all that uh, rambling to the side is you have two, you can now recognize two orders of insects. Okay, the diptera, because they only have two sets of wings, and you can actually recognize a family, Culicidae, okay, the mosquitoes, with the hairy wings uh, and the elongated body. Okay. You also know how to recognize a flea, order Siphonoptera. So you've got two orders of insects under your belt. And with that, we actually got to the point where I remembered to turn the cameras on and we were off and running. So I hope you enjoyed today's lecture, even if it was a little bit out of order from what happened uh, in class. So, oh, by the way, this is a uh, colonial Coenozoan. And I started off with a slightly different background of another colonial Coenozoan, this guy. Um, and it's actually not technically a Coenozoan, this is more like a Filaria, uh, a Philozoan. Uh, you can see that it doesn't have the, but yeah, this one just almost kind of has a cone here. Um, but it's, uh, it's kind of a fun organism. This is a neat one. This is again, not quite colonial, uh, but yeah, it is. This is more like filamentous. Every one, uh, they're kind of forming a chain. And this one though is very nice, uh, easy to spot the, the microvilli on the cone. This one is another colonial just with cells sticking together, no differentiation among the cells. And let's see, did I have another cool one? Yeah, just one of those uh, philozoans that uh, we keep talking about. And the, the very long, thin uh, pseudopods. So given all of this, uh, we're pretty much done with the uh, coenozoa. I'll see you next time.